The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, they voted for Brexit. It's been going on far too long. Now, UK voters are wondering when their government will deliver the goods. One of the most important political issues of the century so far has been completely mismanaged. And they're getting restless. If you want riots on the street, go ahead. Yeah. Take Brexit away. Plus, the actor whose latest role honors the real-life heroes. Apollo 13 and Forrest Gump star Gary Sinise salutes America's first responders on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Here's an alarming fact for you. Recent survey showed 50% of senior citizens had zero savings. Zero. No money at all. So the total of expenditure, the total revenue is going to come from Social Security. And if anything happens to Social Security, those folks are in the cold. And that means there should be some plan to do some saving. Well, the president should have taken a victory lap. He won big with the Mueller report. But instead of that, he, he's gone into the health care and uh, it may be a good move, we're not sure. But Democrats are claiming the high ground on health care and are making the issue a central plank of the 2020 elections. And the president, as I said, has opened the door with his latest attempt to kill Obamacare. And what happened was that a district judge <coughs> ruled that the individual mandate was unconstitutional. Because there's no severability clause in that law, that would mean the entire law is out. It, they could have killed it with, with the one vote of Senator McCain, but he voted, you know, uh, to hurt Trump is what it amounted to. It was, it was kind of a, a mean thing, but he did it. So now people are saying, if you don't have a plan, you're in trouble. The House had a very good bill, and the question is what it is. So we're going to be talking to our reporter about health insurance, what is at stake, and what the plan is to make that better. John. President Trump made a surprise turn by reigniting the Obamacare debate. We're going to be the party of great health care, and the Democrats have let you down. The first indication came Monday when the Justice Department agreed the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional and should be thrown out. Obamacare doesn't work. It's too expensive. And the, the you take a look at everything with deductibles. It's a disaster. It's a disaster for our people. We're not going to allow it to go. And I think what the president's doing is actually wise, which is focusing Republicans' attentions, because if it does happen and Republicans aren't ready with anything, yeah. that's when they're in trouble. Also in trouble could be the nearly 13 million people covered under Obamacare's Medicaid expansion and 52 million people with pre-existing conditions. But the president says this move does not mean Republicans want to take away people's health care, adding that the repeal under place plan would send grants to states for them to run their own health care insurance programs. Trump's effort to repeal Obamacare narrowly failed in the Senate back in 2017. What needs to change to pass this time around? I think people have a lot more information and have spent a lot of time thinking about uh, what could have gone a lot better in 2017. We have a plan that would lower health care costs and improve people's choices and make sure that we take care of the most vulnerable among us, people with pre-existing conditions. It sounds like some Republicans aren't on board, something Marie Fishpaw of the Heritage Foundation hopes will change. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy told President Trump that his new health care push makes no sense. Do you agree? Well, I certainly think that uh, Republicans ran for a very long time on addressing these problems, and I'd, I'd like to think that they'll be able to do so again. Protecting and strengthening health care is why Democrats are here on day one. Democrats made health care a prime campaign issue during the midterms and just introduced a new bill to strengthen the Affordable Care Act. It would make more middle class people eligible for subsidies and even help lower income recipients already in the system. As you remember, uh, Senator McCain ran against uh, Obamacare. Obamacare was extremely unpopular, and it was failing. And then it's been revived because the Republicans didn't do much about it. Ben Kennedy is joining us now from the White House. And Ben, uh, the president has taken on a fight that maybe he's getting criticized for. 
You've heard maybe some reasons of why they did it. Can you tell us what you've heard? Well, Pat, we are hearing the renewed health care debate actually began in the Oval Office right here behind me in the White House on Monday. The New York Times reports that acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney persuaded President Trump to take the legal route, bring this case to the courts, arguing that since the GOP tax package ended a mandate that you were talking about, Pat, the people without coverage pay a penalty. The Affordable Care Act is no longer valid. Plus, a lawsuit to overturn the ACA will help fulfill Trump's campaign promise. Now, the Justice Department got on board and sent their request to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to get rid of Obamacare. A legal battle is expected to reach as high as the Supreme Court. Well, if the Fifth Circuit uh, rules it's out and, and uh, the Supreme Court backs them up, what happens next? Is there a plan B? Does the president have a plan? Yeah, Patty does. That is plan B. If the high court rules that the Affordable Care Act is out, then President Trump says they will have a plan that will be far better than Obamacare. Now, the commander in chief said Wednesday that he understands the complexity of health care now. He said people are going broke trying to pay for their health care costs, citing that rising costs of premiums is to blame. Now, many Republicans want greater transparency, more choices for consumers, which creates competition and could actually lead to lowering the cost of health care. The White House says that a new plan will be introduced in the next coming months as the Health and Human Services begins to craft it. Now, rest assured, the Trump administration says that millions of Americans that rely on Obamacare will not be without health insurance. In fact, I spoke to a, a White House official just moments ago. He said that pre-existing conditions will be covered. Uh, again, you heard President Trump say the Republican Party will soon be known as the party of health care as we now wait, Pat, to see this new plan unveiled in the next few months. Uh, who's pushing this particular uh, uh, stand of the president? Was that Mick Mulvaney or somebody else? Yeah, acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney was in the presidency here during uh, what is considered a policy meeting on Monday. Said, hey, look, we need to get on top of this because as you were mentioning earlier in the show, that uh, health care will definitely be a, a big topic in the 2020 campaign. And uh, uh, President Trump, uh, the White House, they really want to get ahead of this uh, on the campaign trail over the next uh, year or so. Ben, keep us informed. It's an important issue. Well, in other news, <clears throat> the immigration system on our southern border is at a breaking point. Thousands, thousands of migrants illegally enter the country every day. John Jessup has more on that. Thanks, Pat. In El Paso Wednesday, Customs and Border Commissioner Kevin McAleenan said they're facing an unprecedented humanitarian and border security crisis. On two separate days this week, agents arrested more than 4,000 migrants crossing the border. That's the highest total in 15 years. Right now, they're on track to deal with 100,000 migrants in March alone, putting a strain on Border Patrol facilities packed beyond their capacity. While President Trump is sending a warning to Russia, get out of Venezuela. Moscow backs strongman Nicolas Maduro, while the U.S. is standing by opposition leader Juan Guaido. The president reissued that warning after meeting with Guaido's wife in the Oval Office Wednesday, hearing stories of the suffering in Venezuela and the Maduro regime's arrest of one of Guaido's top aides. Here's CBN's Jenna Browder. President Trump is calling on Russia to get out of Venezuela, following reports of Russian troops and equipment arriving in the country. What sort of complications does the Russian involvement now pose? Russia has to get out. During a meeting with Fabiana Rosales, wife of Venezuela's opposition leader Juan Guaido, Trump's message for the Kremlin was clear. You just said Russia needs to get out. Have you um, in any way communicated that? They know. Nations? They know very well. Both he and Vice President Pence reaffirmed their support for Guaido. Our message very simply is that we're with you. The United States is going to continue to stand with you, stand with your courageous husband, and stand with freedom-loving people in Venezuela until your libertad is restored. The United States and 50 other countries back Guaido, elected by Venezuela's legislature to replace dictator Nicolas Maduro. Maduro is accused of stealing the recent election. Russia, though, supports the Maduro regime, which is threatening Guaido's friends and family and arrested his top aide in a raid on his home last week. The wife of Roberto Marrero describes what happened. At 2 a.m., the political forces of Nicolas Maduro enter in a, in a brutal raid in our home. They destroy our house. 
our child's room, everything. They planted guns and things, and this has been for three hours. It was a nightmare. And after that, they, they kidnapped him, um, and we didn't know anything about him for six days. So as a family, we are, we are afraid for his life. We haven't had have any communication. We have a seven-year-old kid who doesn't know anything. There have also been attempts on Guaido's life. We await to warn the world that what we are seeing is a way of attacks against the president. There's repression, there's prison, and what they want is to attack him. All this as blackouts rock the country. People are starving and dehydrated, and riots break out in the streets. Venezuela was a country with tremendous potential and is still a country with tremendous potential. But people are starving, they're being killed, they're being beaten. What's going there is uh, unfathomable to everybody that sees and everybody that gets reports. And President Trump is refusing to rule out military force against Maduro, saying all options are open, even if Russia doesn't leave the country. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. Pat, back to you. I've said many times, if a thug is uh, terrorizing a neighborhood uh, with armed force and terrorizing the people and taking captives and maybe killing people, then the police department must move and do something. And they, it takes force to do that. And we haven't ruled out force. We keep saying we won't rule it out, but we've got to do something. Now, if the Russians come in, we've got what's called the Monroe Doctrine. You know, foreign powers stay out of our hemisphere. And so the Russians are coming into our hemisphere, and they know they're violating the Monroe Doctrine. We have every right to get in there and make, make something happen. But I know we don't want the whole idea of America taking over because that doesn't play well in Latin America. But the organization of American states must, they must come together, and we can back them up with uh, all kinds of weapons, with uh, uh, satellite footage, with drones, with all the stuff we've got, without actually being one of the major players. We can be there, but we don't have to put our troops in there. But something has got to be done, either that they're going to kill Guado if it keeps up. I mean, you know he'll be assassinated, and it'll be a, a, a bloodbath. And we, we need to stop just making threats and get in there and help him. John? Pat, video of an 85-year-old pro-life supporter outside a San Francisco Planned Parenthood clinic is going viral. According to the pro-life advocacy group 40 Days for Life, the elderly man named Ron has been leading the campaign in San Francisco for years. Last week, he tried to stop a pro-choice advocate who stole his sign. As you can see, the young man attacked him. The man apparently had been coming around for days. This video is spurring calls to find the attacker. According to the group, Planned Parenthood refused to give police their security footage because they said Ron brought the attack on himself. Well, House Minority Whip Steve Scalise is fighting for legislation protecting babies born after a botched abortion. He's introducing a petition next week forcing a vote on the Born Alive Survivors Protection Act. As Paul Strand explains, Scalise says the petition is needed because Democrats are using House rules to block a vote on the bill. Last night on the floor for the 17th time, we asked to bring up the Born Alive Protection Act. For the 17th time, the Democrats refused. There are babies being born alive and then ultimately murdered. House pro-life caucus leader Chris Smith described one such murder in a Florida abortion clinic. The clinic owner took the baby who was gasping for air, cut her umbilical cord, threw her into a biohazard bag and put the bag in the trash like so much garbage. Not only are pro-life lawmakers prevented from ending this practice, they can't even get a vote. This is the height of shamefulness. It is absolutely an abomination that this is going on and that we're having to have this argument in the United States today. But Democrats are in charge of the House these days and won't let the Born Alive Protection Act come to the House floor for a debate and vote. Meanwhile, in the states, some lawmakers fear the Supreme Court could overturn Roe v. Wade and legalize abortion nationwide. So states like New York, Rhode Island, and others are pushing radical abortion legislation to keep such practices legal. So is Illinois. They have introduced the Reproductive Health Act, which according to one abortion group, could cement Illinois as the Midwest abortion oasis. Melissa Cifuentes has been fighting a similar law in Rhode Island. 
We are called to use our voice to speak the truth on behalf of innocent lives that are sacred and are worthy of our protection. Halt this bloodlust and work to protect unborn and born babies rather than provide a killing oasis. These legislators are pleading with Americans to call on their Congress members to sign the discharge petition for the Born Alive Protection Act. If that gets 218 signatures, Speaker Nancy Pelosi has to let the bill come to the floor. Paul Strand, CBN News, Capitol Hill. Thanks, Paul. Pat, back to you. Can you imagine the Democrats running on a platform like we favor infanticide? Can you believe they'll come before the American people saying, look, we want to bankrupt the country. We want to cut out airplanes and, and, and automobiles and, and fossil fuel. Uh, we want to run our, uh, well, who knows what, what they want to run the generators on. And we also favor infanticide. Can you imagine a congressman standing on that platform? What kind of insanity has taken over that party? My father was a leader in the Democratic Party. I was a Democrat when I was about 55 years old. I mean, it was a, a, a wonderful party. <laughs> All of a sudden, they've gone crazy, Terry. Well, up next, to Brexit or not to Brexit? This debacle has Britons fighting mad. If you want riots on the street, if you want people like me out there actually talking revolution, fine, go street. ahead, yeah. take Brexit away. We'll break down the botching of Brexit when we come back. The European Union is an oppressive bureaucracy. And the British people didn't like it. So they voted, we're going to get out of the European Union. And it's called British Exit you know, or Brexit. Well, that was fine until they began implementation of it. And then the parliament voted down a plan to imp implement what would happen uh, when British, uh, British uh, nation and the British Empire withdrew from the European Union. And Prime Minister Theresa May is now say, look, I will sacrifice myself. I'll be the sacrificial lamb. I will step down uh, if uh, Parliament approves my plan. Well, the heavenly, uh, heavily debated Brexit has, was supposed to happen tomorrow. But uh, the British politicians are making such a mess of things that the EU is giving them more time to make a decision. Our Dale Hurd has a report from London. For those British who believe leaving the European Union will be a disaster, it seems the world may not end on March 29th after all. It could also end on April 12th or possibly May 22nd. Brexit dates and the facts keep changing. And if you've given up trying to understand what's happening with Brexit, get in line. It's a challenge for everyone, journalists included. This nation has developed Brexit fatigue. I'm fed up with it. I'm still very confused. I've been trying to keep track of it. And while the British remain divided over Brexit, they all seem to agree that they want this ordeal to be over. It's been going on far too long, and I think everyone's getting really, really fed up. Well, I want to have a resolution, frankly, because probably like the rest of the country, I'm bored of it. I would like a deal or a no deal, but I would just like it to come to an end. But what kind of end? And why has the British government put the army on standby? If you want riots on the street, if you want people like me out there actually talking revolution, fine, go street. ahead, yeah. take Brexit away. Yeah. And is Britain really barreling toward a Brexit catastrophe? Or will this be like Y2K, the great disaster that never happened? The leading expert on Brexit, Dr. Richard North, says it's still not clear how hard Brexit will hit the British economy. But some worst case forecast have Britain's gross domestic product shrinking by more than 10 percent. And North says it all could have been prevented. Well, we're looking at a, a catastrophic failure of government. Uh, it, it is extraordinary level of incompetence that we're witnessing. Uh, one of the most important political issues of the century so far has been completely mismanaged. This could have been avoided if the British government had acted differently. The question for some was this simply incompetence or was it sabotage?
Now, I don't know whether it's complete incompetence or whether Mrs May has a cunning plan. Gerard Batten is head of the UK Independence Party, which backs leaving. You could argue that it's complete incompetence, but I find it difficult to believe that head of government and the entire civil service can be this incompetent. I think there is a plan in order to not to make Brexit happen. But Batten we does not think there, terrible four, things are going to happen to Britain nine, after Brexit. And some who voted to leave suspect that all the scary stories and government paralysis is a strategy to stay. The government have a strategy and uh, the strategy is to do nothing to achieve their ends and to that extent they achieved them. At Alfred Enderby's fish smokehouse, owner Patrick Salmon voted leave and still thinks that the referendum results should be respected. Um, Europe's not like it was. We've evolved and, and as grown-up people, we should be allowed to make our own choices. We don't need Nanny anymore. She can go away. Brussels can go away. People voted to leave. They didn't vote for an agreement. They voted to leave and the law has us leaving on the 29th of March with or without a deal, and MPs now come on and say, oh, nobody in Parliament wants no deal. Well, they shouldn't have voted for the um, Article 50 Act and the Withdrawal Act. They seem not to have read the Acts of Parliament that they voted for, if that's their position, because that is the law that Parliament passed. If you really wanted to leave the European Union, if we had a patriotic prime minister and government, we would have left the week after the referendum. But it's still not clear when or if Britain will leave the European Union. What is clear is that those responsible for botching Brexit, Prime Minister Theresa May and her Conservative Party, are about to pay a big political price for it. Dale Hurd, CBN News, London. Well, we're watched with interest, and I, I think the British people would like to get free from the bureaucracy of the European Union. And I, I, I hate bureaucracy, and I, I think if I was a Brit, I wouldn't want to be controlled out of Brussels. But that's... Uh, that's my position, and I'm not in, in England, so I can't say. Terry? It appears there are many who join you on that. <laughs> well, coming up, his role as Lieutenant Dan in Forrest Gump made him a household name. Gary Sinise joins us live to talk about his greatest role in real life, supporting our men and women in the military. Find out why Gary's a grateful American after this. Everywhere he goes, he's recognized for his role as Lieutenant Dan in the movie Forrest Gump. And Gary Sinise wouldn't have it any other way. Let's take a look. After Gary Sinise played Lieutenant Dan in the film Forrest Gump, his life changed forever. Film parts in Hollywood came regularly for him. But since then, Gary's life has evolved into a mission. In the aftermath of September 11th, he established the Gary Sinise Foundation, where he serves and raises funds for America's defenders, veterans, first responders, and their families. In his book, Grateful American, Gary's message rings loud and clear, that he knows where his freedom comes from and honors those who sacrifice so much to provide it. It's a tremendous book. It's called Grateful America. And uh, this man who has had more awards than you can shake a stick at is here with us. Gary, it's so good to see you. Hey, Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you've got a statement here. It was amazing. Uh, you were speaking to a convention of disabled American vets. They'd been wounded in battle. They, had, they were in wheelchairs. And you were standing up there as an actor getting an award. Uh, and <laughs> what went through your mind? Well, yeah, I tell this story in, in my book that right after Forrest Gump mm -hmm. opened, uh, I, I received a, a phone call from a gentleman at the Disabled American Veterans Organization mm -hmm. inviting me to come to their national convention. And they wanted to present uh, an award to me for playing Lieutenant Dan in Forrest Gump. Lieutenant Dan, of course, is a, is a disabled veteran, and mm -hmm. they thought that I portrayed it yeah. in a positive way, uh, that character. So they invited me to their national convention. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I walked down on stage and there were uh, uh, over 2,000 injured veterans in, in the crowd in the ballroom. And they were all applauding. And they had seen the movie, obviously. They were showing clips during the convention. And it was very moving, very 
uh, impactful for me. I never forgot it, and I mm -hmm. stayed very, very involved with the DAV, and now it's been a 25-year relationship, very important mm -hmm. relationship. You, you, this book is really tremendous, and I want to say again, it's called Grateful America. Um, you have been awarded, you have won more awards for uh, uh, the supporting actor, for the best uh, TV drama and all the rest of it. What is your acting technique? Have you got any way, or are you just being you? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to college uh, to study acting. I, I stumbled into it in high school. I tell a story about the first experiences that I had. Uh, uh, as a sophomore in high school when I accidentally fell into theater mm -hmm. in high school and discovered this whole new world. It really turned my life around in a big way. I was a, I was a struggling high school student, uh, really having a hard time in, mm -hmm. in school. And then I fell into this drama stuff yeah. and uh, discovered this whole world. And all I wanted to do was act and then uh, because I'd struggled so much as academically in high school, I uh, didn't want to, didn't feel like I was going to go to college. So I started a theater company with my pals, and I tell the story so that in that Grateful S American about uh, Steppenwolf starting Steppenwolf was, Theater yeah, Company. Okay. Yeah, and that 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 you know that's where I learned everything, Pat. I, I it was just by doing it. We we got together with a group of actors. Uh, John Malkovich was yeah. one of the early members. Jeff Perry, Terry Kinney. Uh, that's that's a picture of uh, one of the early pictures of the ensemble there. And we worked together just in this basement theater. Yeah. We had kind of 88 seats and very small theater, <laughs> and we just focused on our acting, is and that's where I learned like everything. Is there acting or anything like that? Are you just, as I say, you're just you. I mean. we, yeah, we just learned it, and I just kind of, uh, because I wasn't really being... Uh, you know, I didn't, I, the only formal education I had as an actor was in high school, and I had a wonderful, wonderful teacher. She was, she just, her thing about me was just kind of providing this environment for me to be myself mm -hmm. and just to rely on my instincts. And so I learned at a very early age to do that and then went into the theater company at 18 years old, and we started working together, and that's where I learned everything. You know, we... we... <laughs> Making movies isn't easy, and you took on a Steinbeck of Mice and Men. Uh, what drew you to that book and, and that movie? Oh, gosh. Um, well, as I said, I had this wonderful teacher in high school. Yeah. And I remember uh, I was about 16 years old, 17 years old, and she. Uh, w uh, I grew up in, in the Chicago area, yeah. in, a, in a suburb of Chicago. So we were about a five-hour drive to Minneapolis. So she took a bunch of us up on a field trip, mm -hmm. two days up to Minneapolis, to the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. Yeah. And we saw three plays in two days, and one of those plays was Of Mice and Men. And I didn't know anything about it. I mm -hmm. uh, had never read Steinbeck, knew nothing about it. I was early to drama and just learning about it. And they did the play on stage, and I was completely knocked out by Incredible. it. Incredible. So I fell in love with Steinbeck. I started reading uh, The Grapes of Wrath and mm -hmm. other, other things. And eventually we did the play at Steppenwolf. Uh, John, Malko mm -hmm. John Malkovich and I did the play in 1980. And then in 1990, we got the rights to uh, develop The Grapes of Wrath as a Broadway production. Mm -hmm. We took it to Broadway. And it won the Tony Award for, for Best Play that year. And Elaine Steinbeck, yeah. uh, John Steinbeck's widow, she controlled the rights to all his, his material. She gave us the rights to do The Grapes of Wrath, and we got to be very close. Mm. And I was standing with Elaine on the backstage, on, on the Broadway stage, and I said, would you give me the rights to, to make Of Mice and Men into a, a film? And she, she reminded me that it had been a film already, like three times at that point. And I said, well, I think I could do a really good job with it. I, I've loved it from the time I was 16 years old. Please give me the rights. And she did. She gave me the rights to make it into a movie. You were a casting director, did, were you a producer? Did, did you actually direct some of it to yourself? I, I said I wanted to be in it. Yeah. I wanted to direct it, and I was going to produce it. You did. And we went to MGM and pitched the idea mm -hmm. to do Of Mice and Men, and I asked Malkovich to do it with me, and MGM said yes. And so all of a sudden we were making the movie. You're directing. What do you look for? What are you trying to get out of an of a actor? 
You mean as a director? Yeah, as a director. <clears throat> And you, you were director of Ice and Man. What were you looking right. for? Right. You know, the, the, the advantage I had there was that I knew it so well. Uh -huh. um, do you remember Horton Foote? Yeah. Well, Horton, we got Horton to write the screenplay for Mice and Men. Okay. Horton had done so many great things. I mean, pro prolific playwright. He had done the, the adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. um, won an Oscar for that, I believe. And he was just a great person and I thought he would do a great job with Of Mice and Men. Uh, and my producing partner, we, we teamed up, we went to him and he wrote the screenplay and then, mm -hmm. you know, and because I had done the play yeah. and I knew it so well, I, I kind of had it all in my head how I wanted to see it and I talked to Horton about it. And by the time we started shoot, shooting, I, I knew the material so well, having done it before, that it, we just, it just all fell together. You Took the rascal to Cannes, where all those uh, French critics are sitting, and they're all very professional, and they're all they're, they're as cynical as any bunch you'd ever see. And you showed this movie, and you didn't know when there was silence, and then what happened? Yeah, well, that well, that's an interesting story in the book because I had been to Cannes one other time with my first movie. I directed a movie called Miles from Home. Mm -hmm. Which did okay. It yeah. didn't. It didn't really do that well. So I was. Uh, I was wondering what this next journey to Cannes was going to be like with *Of Mice and Men*. And when you go, uh, when you're a filmmaker at Cannes and you're part of the competition, mm -hmm. there there are special seats that the filmmakers sit in that are right in the middle of the theater. And at the end of the movie, they bring the lights up on you, and you either take your punishment or or you get applauded yeah. and if they like the movie they <laughs> they yeah. applaud you if yeah. they don't they you know but you have to sit there and take it and the lights came up on us and the crowd just went crazy and started a standing ovation that lasted 10 or 12 minutes that's unheard of yeah they they wouldn't let us leave and so of course we thought and this was the first screening for an audience that was at Cannes so, of course, me and my producing pals and Malkovich, we, we all thought that, hey, this, this movie, you know, we're off to a great start here. But, you know, it was of mice and men. It's a classic. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, you know, a, it's not the Avengers or anything like that. It was of mice and men. So it did moderately well. Yeah. It was very highly regarded artistically and, and within the industry. But, uh, you know, it wasn't a big mm -hmm. hit. But I'll tell you. Over the last 20 some years since I've done it, I've had high school kids come up to me quite often saying that they've watched it in class because they study the book all the time. Yeah, yeah. So they always watch the movie. And uh, more, more kids have seen it uh, in their classrooms than I ever you saw it in the, the theater. theaters. <laughs> all right, well, the big one we want to talk about, of course, is Forrest Gump. That was one of the greatest movies of all times. It was a, tremendously awarded. And I remember you were saying uh, it got 100 million, and then it got 200 million, and then it got 300 million. And uh, uh, the acting, uh, Tom Hanks was fantastic in that movie. I don't know how he did it. Oh, he, he, he was incredible to watch, incredible to work with, really mm -hmm. fun. It was just, uh, I hadn't done that many films before that. Mm -hmm. I had done of Mice and Men, and Mice and Men came out in 92, mm -hmm. and I don't auditioned for Forrest Gump in 93. All right. So the producers and the director saw of Mice and Men. Tom Hanks had actually seen our production of The Grapes of Wrath. Mm -hmm. So I think they kind of zeroed in and said, let's bring that guy in and, and have him audition for Lieutenant Dan. And I, I went in, auditioned for the movie. I got the part, and then we went to work on it, and every day was very special. Well, the, 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 the story is you had your legs blown off on a, a landmine, and Forrest Grump puts you on his shoulder and, and carries you to safety. Is that, That's the story. Yeah. And yeah. How, how, how do you shoot no legs? I remember you, you, the, the, you, <laughs> in the subsequent thing, you were hanging on a, in a, in a boat thing, and, and you didn't have any legs. <laughs> How'd they do that? I remember when uh, they were trying to figure it out before we started shooting, and I remember getting a call from Bob Zemeckis, the genius filmmaker yeah. who directed Forrest Gump. And he said, we figured out how we're going to do the legs. We're going to take them off in the computer. Yeah, really? And this was the beginning of kind of a lot of very sophisticated computer graphics technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what they did. You know, the blue screen material, yeah, the yeah. green screen, blue screen. 
they wrapped my legs from the knees down in this blue screen material. Mm -hmm. And I would just move around like my legs weren't there. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they went in and took out, you know, in post-production, they took out the really? blue screen that was on my legs. And so there wasn't anything there. Because if, if I'm here like this, and yeah. they, take, they take my legs out, yeah. then there's, there's nothing here except a blank space, right? right? When you remove that from the film. So they would have to go in and put the chair in and put all the background in, <laughs> yeah. frame by frame by frame by frame, they would do that. And it was very sophisticated at the time. It began a whole, now you can, anything you can think of, yeah, they, sure, can, they can do. Sure. Uh, but at that time, people really thought that I was you, you didn't an have amputee, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> the portrayal of, of, of Lieutenant Dan, I mean, he got in some trouble. He was uh, you know, on the street and, you know, helpless. And that's what endeared the vets to you, right? Is the portrayal of that, of that man recovering from those wounds. Well, he's a Vietnam veteran. I have Vietnam veterans in my family. So right. I remember when I had, had the opportunity, and I talk about this a lot in the book because the Vietnam veterans on my wife's side of the family had uh, really impacted me when I met them mm -hmm. and when I talked to them. And back in the 80s, I started supporting various Vietnam veterans groups in, yeah. in the Chicago area. Just they, they faced such difficult things when they went off the war and then came back and the nation was divided. Oh, and they, baby killers and they were spitting at them. It yeah. was terrible. Oh, I had, I had friends who had, you know, bags of feces thrown at them. And I mean, just horrible things. They, yeah. were, they were really treated badly. And not only did they have to go off to war and endure that and the, the things that they saw and witnessed in war, they had to come back to a new battle. Mm -hmm. at home and it was terrible and as I got to know these Vietnam veterans and my wife's family I, I just felt such compassion for them and so I tried it started in the 80s trying to help them and I write very specifically in Grateful American about these Vietnam veterans and working with different Vietnam mm -hmm. veterans groups in the Chicago area and then 10 years later 12 years later I get this opportunity to play a Vietnam veteran in Forrest Gump very much wanted to do that got the part, the movie opened, uh, veterans really seemed to embrace it. That's, that's yeah. why when I got the call from the DAV mm -hmm. inviting me to the, the convention, I mean, there were hundreds of Vietnam veterans, wounded Vietnam oh, veterans yeah. in the audience when I went to that convention. Mm -hmm. I befriended many, many folks, many wounded veterans, stayed very actively involved with them. And then after September 11th, there's a chapter in my book called Turning Point. Mm -hmm. There was a real turning point at that point for me into kind of service work and what I could do to help my country and what I could do to support well, our veterans. You wanted as much as Bob Hope. Were you actually singing out there or you live singing songs? <laughs> How did you do that? With my band? Yeah, with your band. <laughs> well, you know, I, I played music all the way from the time I was in fourth grade through high school okay. and everything. Yeah. Then I got so busy with acting, I didn't play it uh, for a while. And then in the late 90s, I picked it up again. And then after September 11th, mm -hmm. I, uh, I started doing USO tours, and I, I started going out for the troops and, and uh, visiting them and then playing concerts for them and going to the hospitals and playing concerts and different things. And uh, I, I, just, I just found that, you know, the music was a great way to lift spirits. Yeah. It was a great way to deliver a message. Um, it, it was just... You know, it allowed me to get in front of these military audiences and tell them that I appreciated them. Uh, that's such an important aspect of the book, and and really, it turned a corner after well, September 11th. You've got a foundation now for vets. I mean, what do you think, by the way, when they get to these VA hospitals, they've been neglected so terribly. Uh, have you addressed any of that? We're doing all kinds of great things. Uh, I write about all all the various initiatives that yeah. I'm involved in. Uh, supporting many military charities, starting my own military charity, the mm -hmm. Gary Sinise Foundation. We build homes, special homes. This is one of our special homes right there mm -hmm. uh, on screen uh, for one of our families in North Carolina. Uh, these are World War II veterans here. Uh, we take them down to the National World War II Museum mm -hmm. in New Orleans. Uh, we've taken hundreds of World War II veterans down to the museum. We record mm -hmm. them 
on video, preserving their stories at the museum. Uh, these are all initiatives that are part of the Gary Sinise Foundation and our programs. And, and they're just, they just came from different things that I was doing and different ways that I was trying to support our veterans. And it's become a full-time life mission. It's given great purpose to my life. I felt that at, at some point post September 11th that God was just kind of pointing me in this, this direction and saying, you know, use, use these gifts, use these blessings to do some good for the men and women who are defending well, us. They, they deeply appreciate you. You're one of the great heroes. And folks, this book is called Grateful America. Gary Sinise, I won't tell you everything that's in this book. It's a thrilling story of a great American who is, uh, is now a hero for the veterans around the world. And, uh, I'm a Korean vet of the Marine Corps, so I, my, my thanks to you, Lieutenant Dan, for what you've Thank done. Thank you, sir. Thank God you. bless you. Thank you, Gary. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks so much. My pleasure. All right, Terry, what's next? Well, still ahead, we've got your email. Howard says, my mama gossips. When I say something against it, she says it's not gossip when it's between family or close friends. Pat, am I right, or is she? We've got your questions and some honest answers coming up. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN Newsbreak. President Trump is ready to release documents that led to the Mueller investigation, telling Fox's Sean Hannity that he'll make public parts of the Steele dossier, a report, that produced, uh, a report produced by a former British spy funded by the 2016 Clinton campaign. FBI officials used the dossier to get warrants to investigate the Trump election campaign. The president sharply criticized former FBI Director James Comey and ex-CIA Director John Brennan for their roles. Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham is ready to launch a probe into the matter. Well, the FBA is cracking down on organizations that sell abortion pills on the Internet, issuing letters to organizations like AidAccess.org and Rablon, ordering them to stop selling unapproved abortion drugs immediately. Aid Access has been under investigation since October. The organization organization allegedly took orders from women in the U.S. and filled the prescriptions in India. Meanwhile, the governor of Utah has signed into law a bill that bans abortions after 18 weeks gestation, and a federal judge declared a North Carolina law unconstitutional for banning abortions after 20 weeks. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Ma is a mother who lives in Myanmar. She was raising three children by herself on an income of less than a dollar a day. Some days she went hungry. Others she had to ration rice. But now she's able to feed her whole family and it's all thanks to people like you. <laughs> Life was happy for Ma and her three children. Her husband was a farmer who earned enough to provide for the family. Then he died, and Ah had to sell the farm animals to buy food and keep the kids in school. I worried about how to provide for my children. We had to start rationing the rice. We only ate once a day. There are days when I don't eat at all. When I got hungry, I would shiver like when it is cool. My stomachs make rumbling noises. Finally, Ah found a job selling vegetables for a neighbor. She earned less than a dollar a day. When CBN's Orphan's Promise came to their village, we learned about the family's needs. Working through a local church, we trained Aw to run a small business. Then we gave her everything she needed to start a grocery and convenience store in her home. Now I make a lot of money every day. I buy new products to sell, and the business is growing. I don't have to ration the food anymore and I can pay the bills and even buy them clothes. Some days, we eat chicken and fish, potatoes and eggs. Now, the whole family also attends church. Thank you for helping us. 
You know, there are many, many children who are in orphanages around the world because their parents simply can't afford to feed them or to take care of them. So when you give family an opportunity to thrive, to do well, children stay in that family. It's God's purpose and intention. We just want to say thank you, 700 Club members. That's just one of the things you're doing, keeping children at home, in their families, keeping the family intact, and you're doing it in such creative ways. This mom has been worked with and taught how to run her own business and her family will not be poor any longer living on less than a dollar a day prior to your intervention and their need we thank you for joining the 700 club those of you who haven't done it yet it's 65 cents a day 20 dollars a month it's just such a wonderful opportunity to touch the world in a really meaningful fashion our numbers toll free we invite you to join with the rest of us today if you'll just call 1-800-707-000 say i want to join the 700 club today we want to thank you by sending you pat's latest teaching called the i wills of god i want to read to you what cheryl lynn from fort collins colorado said after she watched it she said, we thought the I Wills of God DVD was just excellent. Such wonderful answers to prayer that covered different types of situations. It really helped build my faith and trust in God. I can't wait to share it. And we can't wait to share it with you. And the minute you call, you have the satisfaction of knowing that you are touching and changing lives all around the world. So will you give us a call right now? We'd love to hear from you. 1-800-700-7000. Okay. All right, Ready for questions. Some email? Let's go for it. Questions. This is Fatima who says, are Jesus and God the same? Well, uh, Jesus is definitely God, but we believe in a trinity, a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. And so uh, Jesus talked about the Father, and the Father talked about the Son. But at the same time, uh, they're, they're one. I mean, there's three in one. And Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So. I won't go into all the question about what makes the Trinity up, but that's the, what we believe. And yes, he's God, all right? Okay, this is Howard. He says, Pat, my mama gossips, talks about everybody, their money, the amount they're spending, and if they can afford to spend it. When I say something about it, she says, it's not gossip when it's between family or close friends. Pat, am I right, or is she? No, you're right. Uh, you know, uh, blabbermouth is not a good thing. and. You know, the, the Bible says we're not supposed to reveal secrets about people. And slander is one of those things that will keep you out of heaven. So uh, it's one of those uh, things that Paul said, people who slander, uh, he, he lists that with uh, immorality, uh, slander. And so you know, that gossiping is a type of slander, and slander is not a good thing. So you don't reveal secrets. If, if you're a friend, you listen to what somebody says. but. You don't reveal secrets. It's not a good thing. And Mama is doing something bad. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. This is BJ who says, I like a girl who attends a different church, but I want to date her and even marry her. I've been praying if it's in God's will for the two of us to be together, but I don't know if I should forget about her or pursue her. What do you think? Uh, I don't know the girl and I don't know you. So I, I, I hate to give marital counseling on somebody I've never seen before. But the fact that you go to different churches, the Bible says don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. But it didn't say with somebody who's of a, uh, who goes to the Methodist church instead of the Baptist church. Now, I don't know what kind of church you're talking about, but uh, you can be very unhappy if somebody doesn't know the Lord and you do know the Lord. And uh, to get linked up like that is a miserable thing and you will be unhappy all your life. So. Don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, all right? Okay, this is a viewer who says, since birth, I've been legally blind. I'm in my 40s now. I've had my own family tell me that I wouldn't be able to work because of my vision and that I wouldn't be able to hold down a job. I feel like no one is in support of me. I know that the Bible says that people who don't work are worse than infidels. When Jesus looks at me, is this how he views me? I'm jobless right now. However, my counselor is looking into some things. Your thoughts? I think you need to be productive. We had a man on this program who, who, who was a guide to the blind, and he, he, he went skiing, and uh, he would go skiing, and, and on his chest would be written a, a thing that said, blind guide, <laughs> and people would be scared to death as he's coming down the slopes. He had a very rewarding life. And you look at Helen Keller, who had a tremendously rewarding life. 
So you can have a tremendously rewarding life being blind. And I think your family has done a disservice to keep you from doing that. All right, one last question. This is Carmen who says, Dear Pat, recently there have been a lot of YouTube videos posted about the three days of darkness coming before the rapture occurs. Is this biblical or just fear-mongering? It's fear-mongering. I don't know anything in the Bible that talks about any three days of darkness. So that's, I don't know where they even got that. It's the first time I've heard about it. It's not biblical. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of Galatians. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Well, uh, tomorrow we've got uh, Jesus Cultures. Kim Walker Smith is going to talk about secret, painful secrets of her past. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we ask you to tune in tomorrow at the same time for another edition of the 700 Club. God bless all of you. Bye-bye.